So I want to welcome um, uh, everyone on the council and in the public to our regular meeting of the Larkspur City Council. I'm um, current Mayor Kevin Haroff, um, and today is Wednesday, April 21st, uh, uh, 2021, and we're starting at about uh, 6.33, and we're doing it as we have been doing it for a year now, um, by, uh, by, by video and teleconference only. So let's get started. Um, can we have a roll call and, and well, then we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. Council Member Kandel. I am here. Council Member Paulson. Here. Council Member Way. Here. Vice Mayor Hilmer. Here. Mayor Haroff. I'm here. So with that, let's do the pledge. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag, the flag of, of the United States, States America. of America, America and to the Republic for which it stands, one, one nation, one nation <laughs> under God, God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, and those last words are particularly meaningful this week for reasons that I don't need to explain. So uh, that's agenda item number one. So we'll go on to uh, two, which is public comment. This is only for matters that are not listed on the agenda. This is a time for members of the public to address the city council um, on, as I said, matters that are not on the agenda. And if there is anyone in the public uh, who would like to speak at this time, um, please raise your hand so that Allison can see you and we'll uh, keep things uh, limited as appropriate. So Allison, do you see anybody? Looking for any raised hands from our audience members or any emailed public comment, and there is no public comment. Okay, well, that will uh, settle that one. And I will move on to uh, agenda item number three, presentations and proclamations. And I think we have one, which is listed on our agenda as item 3.1, an age-friendly Larkspur where all people flourish and thrive. And this is a presentation from Sarah Robinson um, from the county. And is Sarah online? I am. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm going to share my screen in a minute, but first I'll just introduce myself. I am here in two with two hats on. I am the Marin County Coordinator for Age Friendly, uh, the Age Forward uh, Action Plan that the county has to bring age friendly across the county, even in the incorporated unincorporated areas. Um, I'm also here as a resident of San Anselmo who uh, helped to launch Age Friendly in San Anselmo uh, starting in 2019. So I thoroughly understand the process and the uh, benefits that this can bring to one's own community. Um, and with that, um, I'm, while I share my screen, I, I, I'm going to ask that um, there's a question that helps us all very quickly to understand this whole concept of age friendly and that is, will you, while I share my screen, think about what is your own vision of the community where you and your family will grow older and what components will it have and that will help entice you to stay there, whether it's Larkspur or someone else, somewhere else. Okay, and great. with that, are you seeing my screen? Thank you. It just, it looks like it just popped up. Okay, great. Um, so uh, in 2006, the World Health Organization uh, launched uh, the age-friendly movement, if you will, knowing, having studied the demographics of the aging society across the world, they felt it was really important for the health and welfare of uh, the human race to look at how communities, countries, states uh, can uh, build their communities around this um, expectation that at some point we, we're, we're tipping this pyramid um, where um, we had more uh, younger adults and younger people to an inverted pyramid where we have more older adults in our communities. And so they developed this process for communities and countries to um, plan for the health and welfare of their aging population uh, while providing uh, support and guidance as they did so. 
um, because this has evolved so much and um, so much uh, evidence-based research is now behind it from many different countries, um, the uh, process in the U.S. has been handed over, the process of support has been handed over to the AARP. They're the U.S. affiliate for the World Health Organization's age-friendly movement. So they provide us the support as any community that wants to consider this. Um, the whole age-friendly concept is based on some key values um, that, are, that we all want, uh, which is active participation in community. Uh, we all wanna live and be treated with dignity. Uh, we all want social connection at all times in our lives. We uh, want the ability to stay healthy and active no matter what our age. And so those are the basic principles which are the objectives for building out an age-friendly community or town. And so to make it easy um, in terms of the process, uh, the World Health Organization created themes or domains which communities will take a look at, their residents will take a look at, they'll decide what is important for our community uh, for us to address what, what, which of these domains, if not all of them, make sense for us to uh, set some goals and objectives in um, as we look down the road um, in a five-year time frame. And uh, what is it that we all want in these uh, within these themes um, that, as we age, that will allow us to age well? Um, what, what are those activities, those policies, those programs and services? that we need to plan for to, to uh, help everyone one, to want to stay in our communities. So um, nine of the uh, Marin municipalities have become age-friendly. Um, Larkspur and Tiburon um, are the two municipalities that are still um, considering it. And uh, I, in the county, am working with the unincorporated areas now to help them uh, move forward in, in, in whatever age-friendly ways they think are correct uh, for their communities um, within these domains. And uh, so I'm working with Marin City and Belvedere and um, San Rafael just um, finished their action plan and submitted it to their council. Um, so we have communities all along the spectrum of the process um, within Marin County. But basically it all boils down to, we're asking how, as we, um, how as we grow, um, how, how can we grow and build and, and care for our community members from when they're children all the way to the end of their lives. And, and keeping in mind that, um, you know, if you want to consider uh, 65 plus, as the census does, as being uh, older adults, um, you know, 65 and 85 looks so different for everybody. Um, there is no homogeneous uh, description of what a 65 or an 85 year old looks like. So it, we take that into consideration when we're planning our communities. And, um, and some like to say we're reimagining aging um, during this process and we're incorporating this thinking of keeping in mind uh, the aging process into just our normal business decisions. Um, we're doing that at the state level, we're doing it that um, at the county level. Um, the state uh, just released its master plan of aging, um, the governor this year, um, and the county released theirs last year. And for both of them, the processes that uh, were being in taken into consideration or what is happening right now in our state? What is happening in our county right now? What are we already doing where we are keeping in mind our older adults? Um, where are we already having intergenerational uh, uh, events and activities? How can we enhance and, and develop those? Um, so what does the age-friendly process look like? Um, it's fairly simple. You file an application as a town um, with the AARP, um, you recruit a task force of residents and stakeholders. Perhaps there's a chamber of commerce member in the, in the group. Um, perhaps there are, um, you know, school leaders there too. Uh, it's a very, uh, it has to be a, a very representational group. 
um, but you file the application with the AARP just saying that your municipality intends to uh, go through this process and, and, and we'll make it an inclusive one. Um, and uh, you conduct an assessment survey like you would with any strategic plan. You're, um, you've given a year to do it and, and these year dates are fluid actually. COVID has certainly interrupted the whole planning sequence for many towns. Um, you create an action plan together, um, you implement it, and then you report back on it, and it's a cycle. Um, what's wonderful about uh, Age Friendly is that you're not alone in doing it. AARP has created a huge support system, grants uh, for, for projects um, that you can apply for, and um, they help you with all the tools. They have surveys you can, you know, template for your use. So, they make it easy for the volunteers who and the stakeholders who are interested in running this task force. Um, but from speaking from a personal experience in San Anselmo, um, where uh, the Parks and Rec Department filed the application and the task force worked with the town manager and the Parks and Rec and the staff to, to launch uh, the survey and the, um, um, the assessment process, um, the, the, it works the best when the town and the volu resident volunteers and the local community leaders are all involved. Um, so I, I just uh, speak from experience there. And, and as the plan is implemented, um, if the town staff are working tightly and closely with uh, the, on the action items with the, the task force and, and the residents, um, everybody's happy. It's not additional work. It's bringing in um, just a new lens to the work that your staff are, are already doing. Um, so let's take a look. Um, the most cost effective way to, to do this process um, is that, as I've mentioned, you want to um, do those, look at the things your town is already doing and, and look at how you can enhance and, and, and perhaps expand that. And, and that's the best way to go, especially in a COVID post-pandemic situation where our budgets are all really tight. Um, the beauty of this five-year process is that it allows for some extra visioning too. You can, you can vision big and, and with the hopes that uh, the economy and or grant opportunities will give you some, some opportunity for uh, developing some, some new programs. Um, but looking at Larkspur, your, your population is what, just over 12,000 according to the 2019 uh, estimates and um, your median age is 49.8 years. So um, importantly, 25% right now of your population is already 65 and older. And that's only gonna go up over the next uh, 20 years. So how can you leverage what you're already doing in planning? And, and I've talked to some of your residents and. My sister lives there, so I have a big investment in keeping her around the rest of her life um, with her family. But so you've got the disaster preparedness um, through your Central Marin NRG program already going on. And that is a model for other communities around Marin. And one of the things that it, it is starting to talk about, like all our communities, is how are we going to reach out and identify our chronically isolated and lonely older adults and how can we give them disaster assistance and education and that your your NRG groups are the answer to that and they already exist and, and there's no money involved in creating a, a strong network there. Um, the chamber um, in San Anselmo we're, we're approaching our chamber on how can businesses become more accessible Can they have readers at the front at, at their desk, um, do they have trip hazards when they've laid out their stores. They have easy to read signs. Again, um, just, just common sense uh, thinking that not everybody pretty is think is uh, got that those glasses on it all the time. We are the healthiest state in uh, California, um, but uh, we don't necessarily have the right activities or accessible activities for all of our residents. So I, I, you know, your Piper Park, your Dolliver Park, great walking paths. Um, how can you improve the mobility and walkability with benches and or um, crossing flags at streets? Um, 
you know, uh, one of your residents suggested a map of, of a walking map of, of Larkspur that provides, you know, a, here's where you can um, use a facility. Here's where you can take a, you know, here are all the benches that we have. Um, here's where you can sit and, um, you know, enjoy a shady spot. Um, so that's a, a common, no cost, very little cost um, activity that an age friendly town will do. Um, so there are lots of strategies for economic growth um, in the age-friendly livable communities uh, model. And um, as the population, older population size increases in Larkspur, um, it just should be a catalyst for innovation, um, whether it's revising how you use the fonts on your website to looking at you know, your housing innovation opportunities. So, um, one of the things that most communities, uh, well, that's across the U.S., um, is that about 46 to 55 percent, this is actually Marin, 46 to 55 percent of Marin residents want to stay in their home. I, when you do your survey, you're going to find the same thing. And about 13 to 20 percent of them want to stay in their current community. So they're willing to give up their home and move to something else or share a home, or, um, and 20 percent are not sure. So you've got, you know, 40% of your community probably when you do your assessment that you've got to convince to stay there and, and you've got to convince them that you are going to make the, the changes and or enhancements that will encourage them to do so. Um, what the beauty is that this is being done all around you in Marin, all around California and the U.S. They're wonderful models that you don't have to reinvent any wheels. Um, and, and again, there are grants available for some of the work that's, that you might want to do. Home repair programs, for instance, um, allowing people to build some accessible bathrooms in there or uh, put in you know, uh, ramps, if you will, um, to help them stay in their homes. Um, so it's a five-year cycle. You can be visionary. You can be opportunistic. Um, based on the economic situation you're in. And uh, it's really up to your residents um, and your employees and your commissions and any other stakeholders, faith groups, um, to find the opportunities that are available for your age-friendly plan. The next steps um, would be to form, have a task force come together from some of your residents and leaders um, I suggest you do what a lot of our towns did, Fairfax and San Anselmo. We invited uh, the, uh, the other uh, age-friendly leaders from other communities to a meeting with our town manager and staff to talk about the benefits, the cost, to get real about from the communities that have been age-friendly for some time. To, so that our, our town could learn, you know, what are they, what's in it for them and how much work is this gonna be? So that would be a good next step for you. Um, and then the step three, um, you, you develop a, a broader list of stakeholders and bring them into the discussions um, about what age-friendly could look like in Larkspur and uh, develop that assessment tool. Um, and that, that gets you on your way, but I think, I'll stop there and, and take some questions. Um, yes, council member. I yeah, but I'm, I'm sorry, I just un unmuted. So do we, I, I see um, Catherine Way raise her hand and then uh, Gabe. Hi, Sarah. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Um, thank and you. thank you, Mayor Hara, for putting this on the agenda, since this was an issue I'm very interested in and very supportive of. Um, I'm really pleased you were able to share uh, not only your own, own experience in your own town, but now as the regional director of this for the entire county, how we can be collaborative that way. Um, I'm, I've learned a lot about this because I've been asked uh, and spoken with Dr. Meredith many times and other members of the Corte Madera age-friendly community. Um, so I'm very familiar with this and I'm glad that you were able to share it with the rest of our council. Um, I'd like to let them ask some questions, but then I'd like to circle back and see where we go from here. Okay, well, I think um, we, uh, we'll, we'll keep, keep it open for questions. And I think um, 
uh, uh, Council Member Paulson had his hand up. Great, thank you, Mayor. Um, Sarah, thank you, great presentation. Uh, I just thought maybe um, to shortcut your step number two there, you know, to get a sense of best practices. So you've had experience with nine other towns here and you know Larkspur, your sister lives here and your neighbor. Um, what, you know, I, I went through all the things you mentioned, you know, some are public works like our ADA compliance and some are IT like our web and closed captioning, which we have and, you know, NRGs and so forth. What, what do you see as our biggest gap or, you know, what would you, you know, kind of help us to start thinking about where this would really provide a benefit? Because it seems like we're covering some of these bases and I'm curious where the shortfall is. Right. Um... You know, given this year, um, I think what if we were all, all of us, nine, all of our towns were to survey our communities, I think we'd see that emergency preparedness um, and um, systems for that to assure that our residents um, feel safe, feel prepared, and um, are supportive of one another. Um, no matter what emergency may befall us in the future. That seems to be a real concern everywhere. And so I think we can all shore up our systems that way um, and our education processes. Secondly, um, we have identified during this pandemic um, that there are so many individuals who live alone, who um, are somewhat isolated and um, who, don't necessarily know about the resources that are available to them to stay connected to others, to get services from the county, um, to um, even get basic transportation maybe when they have to give up the keys. So all of us, um, all of our age friendly towns can do a much better job of um, providing the education, the resource information and, and, and or um, classes or uh, speaker events uh, that uh, provide that education and, and help our residents, older residents feel engaged and yet supported. Um, it's amazing how our assessment tools usually find that we think we're doing a great job pr promoting all our, our events within our towns and our parks and rec available opportunities. And then you get your survey back and you realize that a lot of people just don't know about them. So how can we improve our communication channels to people who don't necessarily use tech, you know, who aren't, aren't as heavily engaged? We're going to work on digital health in Marin County, but um, there are people who will never adopt it. And so how do we reach them and how do we know who they are? Finally, um, some, I talked to the fire chief in Novato today and he's developing a plan um, or has a vision for a plan where uh, they start to keep a database of their individuals who um, live alone and need to be checked on. Um, certainly during this pandemic, we realize that wellness checks and welfare checks are not a bad idea if people opt into a system for that. So those are just a few suggestions that we're looking at across the county. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else on the council? Um, uh, seeing none, I just had a, I just had a I couple think, thoughts. I think, uh, Dan Sorry? Helmer, I think oh. council member Helmer had his hand up. Did he? Uh, thanks, Mr. Yeah, Mayor. Uh, Great. Gabe, Gabe, uh, asked the question I wanted to ask better than I could have asked it. Thank you. So he's been preempted, <laughs> um, which is, which is fine. Uh, and anyone else on the council? I had a couple things I just wanted to. I just wanted to respond to, to Gabe's question too. Is that um, in? I think we are sort of sometimes since we're immersed in this, feel very much like we know what's happening and going on. And when I explore other communities and um, talk to people about what an age-friendly community is, it's not just for the seniors. It's not just for the older people, but it's looking at all of the policies and procedures and and processes that we put in from roads to parks to when we hold meeting times to um, accessibility, not ADA necessarily, but time accessibility, all sorts of things from the whole spectrum of the child to the adult. And I was remarking when I was meeting with Dr. with Larry Meredith, and he gave me an example of, you know, you talk, we put in a playground structure at a park, 
but how about in parallel to the playground structure for children, we put in adult level exercise equipment so that the adults are also engaged in healthy activity with exercise and playing um, a lot parallel to the children who are playing. And that's where you see that spectrum of policy that puts our funds towards all ends of the age spectrum. So I think it's important that we realize it's not just seniors, although a lot of the things need to be gauged towards seniors, but it's the cross spectrum of age. Is Sarah shaking her head? Am I saying it right? Yeah. Uh, you know, for the, the for the interest of time, I really cut out, you know, some of that concept, but age friendly, the moniker is livable for all. That's that's just the definition. So it truly is looking at all generations and how our community is supporting them. But the concept and the research show if you plan for your older adults, if you make sure you have everything accessible for them and, and supportive of them, then you are supporting everyone in your community. So that that's the, Catherine is right on about the concept. Mr. Mayor. Uh, uh, yeah, Dan go ahead. Here. Go ahead, Dan. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Th this is a, a very helpful presentation. I, I think uh, your next step as you describe it is the perfect thing, both to really answer the question that, that Gabe asked and also to uh, get real, as you say, about the cost benefit. So I'd like to uh, encourage that conversation to take place. I, I certainly um, believe in everything you're promoting. It, it's uh, a resource allocation um, consideration. And also uh, I think this would help us understand um, better what we're, we're able to do and and uh, focus a little more with a uh, helpful discussion of, of who, what resources we can share. So I think, uh, I think all of this is very helpful. Thank you. I'd like to make one statement in response to that. And that's, um, you know, that the, of the 10 action items I'm working on right now for the county, Eight of them are things that are already happening in the departments. I just am encouraging them to put that a new lens on it and to see how they can expand, reach, reach a broader population, perhaps reach a target they haven't hit yet. So, and the same, same is true of the state. The state's master plan, especially because it came out after you know COVID started, was it's it's focused on how can we do what we're doing just better. So it's it's not adding the work. It's, it's taking the work and changing how we do it. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Any, anyone else on the council? I see Scott Kandel has his finger up there. Yeah, thanks. Uh, great presentation. Just, just a quick question. You said uh, uh, communities, I think nine of the communities are already uh, age friendly. I am I, assuming that means that they have filed their application with the AARP to start the process. Uh, and if that is true, as I see you're shaking your head, a uh, question to the council is, do we need to give city manager direction to do that? I mean, it seems like a logical next step. Um, I don't know if that requires a motion or anything like that, but it, it seems like I would be in favor of, of taking that next step. Yeah, good. I, I don't know that we could do that uh, tonight, but I think that's a good suggestion and it might be something that we could tee up for the, for the next uh, council meeting. Um, Dan, Dan Schwartz, do you have a thought about that? Um, we can certainly do that, or I can just take this discussion as general direction. Okay. I mean, that'd be fine. That'd expedite things. Okay. We're happy to do that. Okay. Any, any, any objection to that, of course? Okay. Um, no. Good. And I would, um, uh, I mean, getting the support of the council is really what this presentation is about, not only to understand what this is, but to get general agreement that this is something we want to proceed um, and investigate. And I, if uh, without any, um, if there's no one else interested, I'm very interested in being our representative. So when we come to that, um, I've been working already with some of the members of the right. age friendly task force. So if, if uh, we need a representative, I'd be willing to step forward and take that role. 
No, and I think everyone appreciates, Catherine, your your engagement on this issue over time, and I'm I'm sure we would support your continuing in that role in in whatever capacity. Uh, Mr. Mayor, can I yes, clarify please. my my comment? My comment please. was uh, Sarah very uh, clearly described what she thought was the next step, and that was to uh, I think it's described here. I have a meeting. Uh, to discuss the experience of other towns, with, meet with the city manager and staff and bring those who can describe the cost benefit uh, that in the experience of others and offer the best practices and resources. I, and I think after that, then we can, uh, the council would have more information and be able to consider all of these things. Yeah, that, 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 that's valid. So, I mean, I think we can still provide um, the city manager with some direction about which way to go, but I, I agree with you that that interim step may be appropriate and maybe have it come back to a, a future in the near term uh, council meeting just to get it all ratified. Well, Mr. Mayor, if I may, the yeah. first step on that four point list is to form a task force. So perhaps I should reach out to Ms. Robinson and discuss. Yeah her recommendations on how that works and then bring that to the council and you can endorse that as well as instruct me to take the other steps. Yeah, I think that I think that's that's kind of what I had in mind. So that uh, I think that's fair enough. Well, so would, Sarah, would, Sarah, if you're if you're willing to, to pursue that process, course. we'd appreciate it. Of course, I'm, I'm here to be a resource for all towns. Yeah. Okay. How and I think that? we have a lot of people in the audience who participants in the audience who um, are interested in task force roles. So they're probably wanting to speak to that when, when we open it to the public. Yeah, well, let's let's get to that then in just a second, I'll open it up to the public. Um, I just had two thought, thoughts, this is Kevin again. Um, uh, uh, one, your, uh, Sarah, Sarah, your, thank you very much for that presentation, it was terrific um, in, all, in all respects. Um, one thing that kind of resonated with me in, in your presentation was um, your comments about um, creating opportunities for folks to uh, walk around the community. Um, and the reason it resonated with me is that's, that's a conversation we've been having within the Chamber of Commerce, which I'm a member of. Um, and of course, the Chamber of Commerce wants to promote businesses, but they also want to promote the larger community. So my suggestion would be if you haven't had an opportunity to do that, um, I mean, reach out and make a connection with our local chamber of commerce. I think there's some some really good synergies that we could uh, exploit that would meet some of your needs and well as as well as promote some of what the chamber is trying to accomplish. Uh, the, the 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 walkability proposal that we've been talking about within the chamber is called the loop, and it's really designed to create pathways for both people within our community as well as visitors. Um, to uh, to see different parts of our community, both the commercial aspects and historical aspects, in a in an in an easy way. Um, so that that's going to be something that that the chamber is working on, and I really would encourage you to maybe, uh, and I'll also encourage her, Julie Cervetto, who's our executive director at, at the Chamber of Commerce, to maybe make that uh, link up. I think it would be mutually advantageous. The other thing that kind of resonated with, with me on your presentation is the educational aspect. And, you know, obviously we are in close proximity with a terrific educational institution, which is the College of Marin. And um, uh, I'm just kind of curious if, uh, if and what to, ex to what extent um, you've engaged with them to create educational opportunities that aren't necessarily just focused on Larkspur, but are focused on our larger community. Indeed. Um... We have an age-friendly Marin uh, network collaborative, if you will, of all the leaders. We have a monthly uh, educational forum, uh, speaker forum that we hold, that we promote throughout uh, the ESCOM uh, College of Marin Alumni uh, Association group. Um, they attend um, and uh, Dominican University has just become an age-friendly university. Uh, one of the, the first in the state actually and so they are also part of this network. So we all, all the leaders from the age-friendly towns and municipalities come together uh, three times a month to uh, support one another uh, where they are in this process. 
um, to build educational opportunities and resource opportunities for our uh, residents, uh, all the residents. And uh, it's also an opportunity for the county to share resources as well and networks uh, to, with the local communities um, and to know what's happening, you know, what's the latest that's happening in uh, food, let's say during the pandemic, you know, where can you get, where your residents get food if they need it? Where can they, uh, what's the latest in, in transit um, opportunities for people who maybe broke their leg and, and are short-term disabled. So uh, yeah, it's a tight network. Uh, again, yeah, that's why I say becoming, considering becoming age friendly means you're part of a, a large group of support, resources, education, and um, co collaborative efforts. Right. And, and Larkspur is kind of sitting in the middle of a variety of different communities that share resources and um you know, I, I would hope that we can play a role to help facilitate um, your success in pursuing those efforts. So unless there's any other comments from council members, I guess it's probably time to open it up to the public. Our first public comment will come from Patty Stolier. Okay, Patty, Good go evening. ahead. Thank you for having me at your meeting. Uh, I am the lead for Age Friendly Corps de Madeira since 2014, and um, we're big cheerleaders to see uh, Larkspur join our ranks and uh, are offering all kinds of sage advice and support and everything we can do to make it easy for you guys to uh, go down your pathway. I wanted to follow up on a couple things that Sarah pointed out. Uh, one was about the disaster preparedness. And um, I think for me, it really came home after the Sonoma County fires. And we saw that the people who were uh, isolated and unable to get out were the elderly. And those were the people that we lost in the fires. So it, it's like my driving thing is to try to figure out how, how we can make that a better process. Sarah also talked about the, um, and um, maybe uh, somebody else brought it up too, the um, exercise equipment. Uh, oh, I think Larry had brought it up, exercise equipment for different generations. And uh, Sausalito has been uh, successful very recently. The Age Friendly there worked with the town and uh, created a new park that has a lot of the equipment for the, um, older adults to be using alongside. And then one of the things that I was going to bring up that definitely go for the low hanging fruit, that's how you start out and, and see, like Sarah said, what you've already done and put it on an age-friendly lens. Okay, so um, uh, one of the early things we did was when they were changing out uh, traffic signals, it's like put down the countdown timers and give people longer time to cross the street because you'll ask any old person, you cannot make it across the street before the light changes. So things like that, that, that we started. And Larry has been so dedicated. Larry Meredith has come to all of these meetings for years trying to get Larkspur um, to move along the, with the uh, planning for this. So I'm really delighted to see uh, Sarah's presentation tonight. And I extend a hand of support and and applause uh, for everything that you're doing uh, to help make this dream of ours come true, that the whole county has age-friendly towns and cities. Thank you. Great, Patty, thanks very much. And I think tonight is an opportunity for us to be taking some good first steps to, to accomplishing uh, some of those goals. Anyone else in the public? Our next comment will come from Linda Jackson. Linda? Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Linda Jackson, I am uh, wearing my hat as Program Director for the Aging Action Initiative, which is a collaboration in the county of public sector like yourselves, healthcare sector, and nonprofit uh, organizations all working for the well being of older people. I was also on the San Rafael Task Force for the San Rafael Age Friendly Plan. So I'm going to share a couple of thoughts from that. Um, a lot of the work is inspired by Enrique Peñalosa, who was mayor of Bogota 
And you may have heard about the work that he did there to really transform Bogota into an age-friendly city. His brother founded the 8 to 80 organization, which uh, it, it, the statement is, if it's good for an eight-year-old, it's good for an 80-year-old. And if it's good for an 80-year-old, it's good for an eight-year-old. So age-friendly really does, as Sarah talked about, capture the intergenerational uh, needs of all age groups in our county and in our communities. I wanna note that the whole process of the planning effort is scalable. So what might have been done with the county with the, the full-fledged community group, interdepartmental department heads from each uh, department participating was scaled down in San Rafael. We had uh, the now mayor uh, was our um, uh, advocate. I think she came to two meetings altogether but uh, she was a voice and a contact throughout the process. We did have one staff person who attended our task force meetings and our task force was really a group of eight uh, residents who were interested in putting together a plan. The, the draft plan was shared with the city staff and revised uh, within the capacity of staff and has been accepted by the city council. We are now in the process of working with department heads on um, the different aspects, but it's very much a collaboration and within what you might say is the bandwidth of staff to move forward um, on the work. And then finally, I'll just add in a note about uh, the lens of ageism. So some of what you will hear is the word ageism. Uh, there's efforts, uh, it's a U, uh, UN World Health Organization uh, initiative to fight ageism throughout our, across the world, across our country and across our county to recognize and give due uh, attention to older people who have lived here, uh, love your community, want to stay there. And one of you asked about what are the issues that might raise up, that'll come out from your community outreach in the survey. We found in San Rafael, there was a real interest in, uh, options for where to live as one got older, as well as um, fostering more intergenerational kind of activities. So those are some of the things we'll be working on through recreation and our local library. Thank you so much. And we uh, AAI stands uh, ready to support you as you move forward. We're just very excited to hear this. Thank, thank you, Linda. And we appreciate your efforts and uh, your willingness to engage with us and ours. Anyone else in the public, please? Our next comment comes from Sybil Boutillier. Hi, Sybil. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, so, uh, my name is Sybil Boutillier, and I'm the chair of South Salido's Age Friendly Program. And we were the first one to start in the county. And um, began by um, very simply a group of the pub of older adults, small group of older adults in the community came together having heard the, about this program. And we were the third in the state to start up. And um, what we did was go to the city council, say, we'd like to do this. And if you'll you know, give us your blessing, we will come back to you with, um, with uh, our basic plan, but what, the only thing you, we, you need, the only thing actually you need to start the program is a letter from the mayor saying that the city is interested in committing to doing a five-year plan, a five-year five cycle of improvement to make, it, make their city more age-friendly. You don't have to specify anything. You just say, yes, we're interested in doing this. And as the mayor, I you know, will um, say, yes, we want to do it. And um, starting with that, you can apply directly to the World Health Organization or to AARP. We started with the WHO and later joined the AARP um, as they started developing things to help people in this country who were doing the program. But I just want to say it didn't cost the city a penny when we got started. Um, we did do a survey, but a survey isn't necessary. I know that Fairfax, I don't know if Jody's on this call, but 
Fairfax just did a survey, I mean, a, um, uh, an assessment of what things they were already doing in their community that could be considered friendly for uh, older people, uh, making the city more accessible. Maybe they're, for example, they had some benches um, placed around, you know, that people could rest in if they were taking a walk. Simple things like that. Some cities, rather than developing nine or 10 different domains, have only developed one or two to begin with. In their first, you know, five year plan, they just said, these are the two things that we're most interested in in our community. And that's exactly what they built their plan on. And um, a lot of it can just be tweaking things you're already doing to add that extra little bit that makes, you know, makes a difference for older adults um, or for turning something into more of an intergenerational opportunity. In Sausalito, just quickly, I'll mention a few things we did. Um, we, uh, we built upon the already existing medical rides that Sausalito Village was doing, like Marin Village, um, and opened that up to the whole community by getting more volunteers to give rides just around town within our community. So someone who wanted to come downtown to go shopping and didn't no longer drove or didn't have transportation out to their residential area could get a free ride with a volunteer driver to bring them down to our commercial district and do their errands. And um, that was a wonderful beginning to sort of build um, recognition throughout the community. And from the city's point of view, they started seeing more people show up for library programs, for rec and park programs, coming to city council meetings and participating more because they had a way to easily get there. And so that was really the first thing that we did. And um, it really made a difference in terms but, of engagement. So Sybil, that, that's all, the, the, the very terrific insights for all of us. I'm, I'm kind of mindful of the time. And if there's, if you want to make some wrap up comments, that would be helpful. Right, so I just wanted to make the point that um, the, the, you don't have to look at starting out by putting a lot of money into this program. It's not, that's, that's not required. Um, in some cases, the city put no money into the program and people still work with volunteers and with city, um, but with city liaisons so that the city gave some staff time from, but not, uh, but, but didn't have to invest um, fiscally. So I just wanted to make that point. And also Great. Great. a very Thank important you. thing in this whole process is the exchange of best practices. So throughout Marin, we're all learning from each other and being able to Im improve our cities by learning what some of the other cities are doing. And that's a very, very valuable uh, process that we're all um, benefiting from. So thank you very much for listening. And I hope you'll join our community of age-friendly cities here in Marin. And thank you for considering it. Okay, great. Thank you, Sybil. Appreciate very much your, your comments tonight. Uh, and we'll take advantage of your uh, the resources that you, you can provide. Um, Allison, anybody else in the public? Yes, our next comment will come from Larry Meredith. Okay, and Larry, just uh, if you could make sure you kind of uh, keep Mayor? things as short as possible. Yeah. Uh, can Hillman? I ask a question of the last speaker? Yeah, no, please, if she's still on. Okay, one moment. Uh, Mr. Meredith, I'm going to mute you for a moment. And Sybil, um, you are unmuted. Uh, Sybil, thank you for your comments. This is Dan Hilmer. Um, I have a question. Uh, in your comments, you referred to the city of Sausalito, if I got this right, um, offered free staff time to your uh, efforts? Uh, yes, sir. Our, um, our director of Rec and Park, Rec Parks and Recreation, Mike Langford, was assigned as our liaison. Um, we also um, uh, had dealings with our city manager, 
um, you know, he would, you know, advise us on certain things. But, but uh, Mike Langford, the Recreation Park Director, is our ongoing liaison. And we have worked with other uh, city department heads on different projects where we were able to add value to something that they were already considering doing. I was and, just wanting to clarify your comment about um, staff time without any financial uh, commitment. I heard the, I heard you say that, and I wondered that you. So you're saying the city of Sausalito. Right. Um, so for the first uh, two years, um, the city of Sausalito did not invest any actual cash into any of our programs. Um, we did get a small grant from the municipal um, uh, transportation authority, a prop uh, B uh, grant uh, for um, um, alternative transportation. Um, and um, that helped us um, pay for the background checks and so forth for our volunteer drivers. But the city found that program of our volunteer drivers um, so valuable that when our grant ended after 18 months, they offered to pick up the cost of the part-time person who matches the drivers with the riders and does the background checks. And uh, But prior to that, the city did not cost pay anything into the program in any way, but invested a small amount of, that, of staff time to um, help steer us in certain ways or to listen to ideas and see how they could, how we could work together on making something the city wanted to do better and vice versa. Thank you very much for clarifying that. Very helpful. Yeah, and thank you for that question, Dan. Um, I think we have the next speaker is uh, Larry Meredith. And Larry, if you could keep your comments to less than three minutes, that would be, that would be helpful. Larry, you're muted. And Larry, I'll ask. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Council Members, uh, Sarah, I want to thank you for uh, uh, joining in this discussion, having it on the agenda. It's age-friendly. Larkspur is a very important concept, and I, I'm a 20-year resident of Larkspur. I I'm, I'm, uh, live up the uh, Madrone Canyon. I'm 80 years old. I want to spend the next 20 years in Larkspur, and I want to make sure that it's a thriving, age-friendly community that, that uh, enables the, the synergy that you were talking about before of the chamber, of the uh, schools, of the, uh, the uh, town council, um, the businesses, the, the recreational areas, the Larkspur walkers all join together to create a vision of what is possible. And I think that the expression that the, uh, the fish, I, I mean, this is not a criticism either. I, none of this is to say that Larkspur hasn't done a wonderful job and you and your various roles have done a, a, an amazing job of making Larkspur all it can be. However, when you bring in a, a broader community to be engaged and have the age, the, the, the aging lens, I think important discoveries can be made. And these are the opportunities that Sarah's talked about and others have. And as you can see, there's incredible enthusiasm from the various communities and throughout the county to help Larkspur be all that it can be. So thank you. For, for this and uh, I, I remain, remain a strong advocate for age-friendly Larkspur. Well, thank you very much, Larry. Um, those were excellent comments and we will look to you as a, as a resource. Anyone else in the, in the public, Allison? The next comment will come from Diana Lopez. Okay. Oops. Hi, Diana, we're, having, we're getting some static here. See, Diana Lopez, it looks like you're unmuted. Are you able to speak? It looks like our connection is poor with Diana at the moment. No. Well, let's see if that, that sorts out. Why, why don't we see if there's anyone else in the public who would like to make a comment? 
Looking for any further raised hands from our audience members or any emailed public comment. And there's no further public comment. Okay. You want to ask Diana if she's gotten back on or check on that? I don't want to just cut her off unnecessarily. Yes. Diana, I'm going to ask you to unmute one more time and see if it works again. Yeah, I think we got a we, I think we got a bad connection. Okay, well that didn't work out. <laughs> um, uh, but anyway, uh, thanks to everyone from the public who took the time to join us tonight and and share their comments and perspectives. And um, I look forward to working with everybody to to make progress on this issue. So unless there's any other comments from council, I think we'll wrap this one up. I just want to say thank you to Sarah. We've been working together on other in other committees, and uh, she's an invaluable resource to um, the county and to us if we decide to move forward with this. Um, she has been presenting at various disaster council meetings that I attend. So the synergy, as Dr. Meredith just said, is, this is the potential synergy we have with so many different um, areas in our community that are serve that serve our our families and our seniors. So. Um, I look forward to working on this, and I think you heard from several people in our audience who are also interested in task force relationships. So we've got a, a good crew here, and we have a really good symbiotic relationship with the town of Corte Madera, who's been at this a long time, and uh, we have a lot of overlap in our committees with the town of Corte Madera. So uh, next steps will be fun. Thank you, Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council members, for having me tonight. I'm here as a resource. Um, and we will take advantage of you. Thank you very much for, for appearing tonight and sharing your thoughts and insights. Um, we'll be talking. So I think that will wrap up uh, agenda item number three and we'll move on to agenda item number four, which is approval of the consent calendar. Um, and I guess uh, before we make a vote on that, I'd like to ask if there are any members of the council that would like to take uh, any of the items on agenda item number four uh, off for separate consideration? Uh, yeah. Uh, Council members, uh, Kandel. Uh, yeah, 4.8 and 4.9. I just wanted a little bit more explanation on. Um, so we can pull that, uh, or at least I could, I could hear a little bit more detail about it so I understand it a little better. Okay. Um, do you want to pull it or you just want to hear some... Um, uh, our city manager address that. I, I could I could leave it on and just hear the city manager address them if that's uh, city manager feels comfortable with that. Sure, uh, be happy to. Did you want to ask if there are any others, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, is there anyone else, or are those the only two? Um, sounds like those are the only two. So, uh, if... Gabe. oh, I'm, I'm sorry, curious. Gabe. Right. Yeah, um, briefly, um, 4.6, and I, I spoke with the city manager earlier. I just thought it might benefit our audience to, to hear a little bit about what we're doing for service sharing with Mill Valley. I mean, I know the report is pretty self-explanatory, but I wanted to at least call that out and you know, applaud um, the city manager and also Julian for, for moving in that direction. So, so maybe just a minute to explain what that is to the public. Okay, um, so let's see. Just lost my agenda here. So that's 4.6 and 4.8 and 4.9. And I don't think we're getting a request to have them removed from the consent calendar, just an opportunity to uh, get some insight about what those matters um, concern. So uh, Dan, if you're comfortable doing that, well, let's do that and now. I'm sorry, if you want, I, I can kind of narrow down my question instead of a general, you know, talk about it for, for 10 minutes, if that would help. Um, well, hopefully not 10 minutes, but um, uh, yeah, go ahead if you want to express your concern. Sure. sure. So, so in, in 4.9, uh, I believe there's $130,000 going to part-time code enforcement. I, I just wanted to understand um, what that was. It seemed like it was maybe two days a week or something like that. Uh, I didn't understand if the reason was because the revenues that were collected from having a part-time code enforcement paid for uh, uh, that salary or there was another benefit to the city that we saw. Just uh, I want a little bit more explanation about that. 
Uh, and 4.8, I think I just need a, it was a little bit too vague for me uh, as far as uh, what we're actually getting, what the consulting services are. Um, so if we can just understand that a little bit better, I think it'd be helpful. Sure, I'd be happy to address both of those. I do see that the planning and building director is in the audience and has raised his hand, which is his way of also saying he's available. If, uh, if you want more detail, then I'll offer you. Um, let's start with the first one, I think is the 4.8 is the software package. So um, as part of our five-year technology improvement plan, one of the weak points that was identified is the software used by the building department to manage uh, permits and manage uh, projects and keep the synergy of the two together. Um, we use a fairly archaic uh, program that the uh, company that we got it from actually has abandoned in favor of a different product. So um, we went out and did a request for proposals and shopped for a new product um, and Central Square was our selected choice. So you're purchasing, you're authorizing us to make a purchase of the software license for uh, the building and planning staff to use Central Square as its main product for permit tracking, project tracking. Uh, what's particularly exciting for us is um, we have no ability to do a digital interface currently with that type of information for the public and Central Square will offer that. So we'll be able to offer, expand our online services considerably. Um, and the city council did adopt a technology fee. This is probably the number one purpose for that fee is to make the purchase of these large software packages um, to upgrade our systems. So that's what that item is about. Um, the second item is the not to exceed contract for 130,000 is uh, actually for two services. Um, Four Leaf is a vendor that we've used in the past for code enforcement support. Um, and about roughly eight, 75 to 80,000 of the amount is estimated to be applied to uh, potential code enforcement use uh, and having a code enforcement person on the premises uh, two times a week. Um, this is to enforce the municipal code, particularly as it relates to property and uh, complaints that we get about activity around town. Um, the council has always uh, instructed us to take a gentle hand with code enforcement and to seek compliance. So we actually have, do not collect a lot of fees or fines for code enforcement. Uh, we use code enforcement as a tool to educate people about what our municipal code actually says. And we have a very good track record with Four Leaf of getting folks to come back into compliance. Um, so it's the very rare occasion when we've ever actually find somebody. Um, we, for the pandemic, we stopped funding this uh, with Four Leaf and we brought it in house temporarily. And uh, we've actually had trouble keeping up with the complaints that we're receiving. So as our budget has improved, we wanted to restore that service so that we could offer it to the community. The other issues we're going in the building season, as I've reported to the council recently, um, one of the surprises for us in the pandemic is that our building permit quantity didn't subside. It stayed roughly the same. The nature of what we were issuing building permits for changed, but uh, we've been very busy and spring is our busiest time. Uh, we're not yet ready to recruit and replace one of our permit techs. So in order to get through the spring rush and, and to manage the situation, particularly as we do our software implementation, uh, Mr. Toff and I thought it would be appropriate to ask for Leaf to provide some support to the permit tech function. So um, that's another person who would come in temporarily uh, to support our in-house staff to keep the load manageable. I don't know if you have any additional questions about either of those. Um, no, this, um, this is uh, Kevin. I, I'm really uh, quite happy to see uh, 4.9 uh, going forward because I think that um, code enforcement has been a challenge for uh, the staff that we have and to provide them with some additional resources, I think, uh, will be um, very helpful. 
Um, so I think there was a question also about 4.6. Well, I just want to make sure I addressed everything, if you don't mind, Mr. Mayor, from yeah, no, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Dan, my, my, my only uh, other question was that uh, at, uh, I think you said about $80,000 for two days a week comes out to about $200,000 for a, a five day a week position. I just want to make sure that's that I'm assuming that's market value for a code enforcement officer. It just seemed really high to me. That's all. Um, so uh, that again, uh, sorry, I believe if I pull that item up, that 130,000 is to take us through the remainder of this year and through next fiscal year as well. Um, so I'd have to sit down and do the math. It's also an, um, not to exceed. It may not be that we spend that much money. We were sort of estimating out what's the maximum amount of time we might end up requiring from our service providers. So um, I can bring Neil on and he could probably give you a little more detail about uh, what his expectations are um, and what the hourly rates are, because there is an a la carte system that Four Leaf uses to tell us what that I, I think I think more than that, Dan, I, I just wanted your assurances that you guys looked around and you did price comparisons. I mean, it seems a little high to me, but but it's not my field. You know, if you tell me, hey, we looked around and this is reasonable compared to what what uh, this call, uh, you know this goes for, I'm satisfied. I, I just want to make sure that, that that you guys did that. I think it is, and I should note before we leave this item, we are in discussions with a couple of the cities that provide code enforcement officers in house, and long term, we'd like to convert code enforcement into a shared service with another community. But right now the communities we're talking to are reestablishing their own program and need to complete that process before they can fully engage us. All right, you have answered all my questions. Thank you. Great. Uh, and then I think Council Member Paulson wanted us to highlight the fact that uh, on the consent calendar is a shared service arrangement um, for uh, with Mill Valley to share a public works inspector. So most public works department, public work departments rely on an inspector uh, to protect the interests of the public when there are projects that encroach into public space. So um, we've been doing this for quite a while by outsourcing it to a consulting firm, an engineering firm that can provide that service. Uh, we actually had proposed to you in the current, uh, in the previous budget before the pandemic that we bring the service in-house then the pandemic hit and we froze that position. Uh, in the interim, we uh, had some discussions with Mill Valley, which was thinking very similarly. And we decided for the time being, we would see what would happen if we shared uh, a person. This will be a Mill Valley employee and we'll be paying for time from that person. So from our perspective, we're shifting something we currently pay a consulting firm to do to paying Mill Valley to do it for us. Okay. I think that that's, if that's it. Um, Councilmember Paulson, did you have any further questions on that? that yeah, item? no, thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to mention in our strategic meetings, we talked about collaboration sharing. I just wanted to thank both the city manager and the public works director. Thank you for that. Okay. All right. So, so no council members requested, I mean, uh, particularly in light of the conversation we've just been having. So I don't think we've got a council request to pull any of the items off the consent calendar. So I think we need to ask the public if there's a request um, to do that Mayor. as well. Yeah, uh, Mr. Helmer? Uh, I'd like to make a motion to uh, adopt the consent calendar before you entertain public comment. Uh, uh, motion is there, um, but let's see if there is any public comment and then we'll just have a vote. Looking for any raised hands from our audience members. And there's no public comment. Okay, good. I'll second the motion then. Okay, uh, Council Member Way, let's have our vote. Council Member Kandel? Yes. Council Member Paulson? Yes. Council Member Way? Yes. Vice Mayor Hilmer? Yes. Mayor Haroff? Yes. So the consent calendar is approved. And we will move on to agenda item number five, which is our city manager's oral report, even though we've already been taking um, lots of information from him, but you, you may have other things to address for us. So go ahead, Dan. 
I uh, just want to highlight some items that are also on the homepage of the city website, but I uh, wanted to make sure I highlighted them here. Uh, first, our two uh, upcoming workshops that I had mentioned to the council at your last meeting. Uh, next week on Tuesday, April 27, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., uh, city staff will be in the uh, parking lot that's at the intersection of Magnolia and Ward Street. Uh, we'll have some displays that discuss our uh, concepts that are being considered and evaluated by a team of uh, staff and consultants with respect to potential improvements in the downtown corridor. We also will be um, sharing some of the best practices and policies we've reviewed for parklets, and we'll be inviting the public to give us some feedback about all of those topics. We thought it'd be appropriate to give it a try outdoors at the parking lot, uh, and people can then take a stroll before they give us their feedback if they're so inclined. Um, this is not a, uh, it starts at 10 with a presentation kind of thing. People can drop in anytime from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. to engage the staff. We will do a follow-up. We haven't scheduled it yet. We are going to do a follow-up Zoom meeting for folks who couldn't make it to um, to the event on the 27th or who aren't comfortable yet with a, a, an in-person engagement. The other thing uh, I wanted to note is we have been highlighting that we're going to do a workshop on the climate action plan that's in draft form and in circulation now. Uh, we rescheduled the workshop. It was originally going to be on Wednesday the 28th. It's been moved to Thursday, April 29th it's at 6 p.m. That's an online uh, Zoom um, workshop, and we welcome the public to follow the links that are available on our website. And then lastly, just wanted to make sure um, folks are aware that uh, the, um, um, oh, I'm sorry, this one's dated, I apologize. That's actually it, Mr. Mayor, That's my third one. Okay. Great, any, any comments or questions on the city manager's oral report? From council, anything from the public? Looking for any raised hands from our audience members. Oh. There is no public comment. Okay, well, good. Well, thanks, Dan. I think that will conclude that item and we'll move on to number six, which is council members' oral reports and comments. So I would invite any member of the council to provide uh, a report on anything they would like to address. And I see Vice Mayor Helmer has his hand up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Two quick items um, regarding today's uh, SMART board meeting. Um, I represent the uh, Marin mayors and council members position to the SMART board of directors. Uh, today at uh, the SMART board meeting, general manager Farhad Mansourian announced his retirement, which is uh, significant in both uh, terms of operations and also I think significant in terms of the history of the county of Marin. So I uh, I'll leave that, uh, you'll be hearing more about that I'm sure through all media channels. Also uh, today we uh, recommended adoption of a capital improvement program at SMART uh, that essentially closed all the bikeway gaps between Larkspur and uh, Cloverdale. So we're uh, is a, a lar very large uh, financial commitment, uh, assuming, of course, uh, a sales tax renewal can be uh, accomplished in the next few years. So I, I, the, both uh, items, I think, are cause for both cel celebration and uh, acknowledgement. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Homer. Anyone else on the council? I see Catherine Way has her hand up. I just wanted to mention two things that are coming up. Um, LAFCO, Marin LAFCO is sponsoring a shared services workshop. And that's next Thursday from 9 to 12 that I will be attending. Um, if anyone else is interested in attending that, it's open to general managers, board 
uh, members, agency staff, and general public. I'll send the um, workshop announcement to Allison, then she can distribute it to all. But the first panel is exploring successful shared services in Marin. And our uh, town manager of Cormadera, Tal Kusumano, will be presenting. And I think it will be about um, the fire merger. Uh, and panel two is how to implement a shared services model. And um, there are other uh, former Marin council members who will be presenting there. So if you're interested, it's free and it's on Zoom and it's from nine to 12. And I'll send that to Allison. Um, the second thing is I've been asked by Supervisor Rodoni to speak at the Board of Supervisors meeting next Tuesday and give them an update on, um, I am the Marin mayors and council members representative to the uh, DC3, which is the County Disaster Council. And I co-chair their subcommittee on um, emergency preparedness education. So it'll be a presentation about 9.30 on Tuesday about what that subcommittee is doing. Um, I think it's also uh, sort of timely because Sarah Robinson has been participating with us on that committee and in, in helping to define vulnerable communities within Marin that um, are lacking in emergency preparedness. And much of the work that she showed us earlier um, uh, dovetails with that work that's being done in the county with disaster preparedness. So that's uh, 9.30 on Tuesday. That's all I have. Okay, great, thanks. Anyone else on the council? I see council member Paulson. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, also two brief items. Um, one is since last year, I've gotten uh, increasingly involved with Marin Youth Healthy Partnerships. And you know, some of you may know, uh, Larry Chu was one of the key people who did the grant writing and got the program. Going. And they're gonna run out of funding next year in 2022, they have a federal grant. And so um, they formed a, um, you know, a nonprofit status and um, I've uh, agreed and really look forward to working with both uh, former council member uh, John Wright in San Anselmo and Larry in, in trying to get funds and do the grant writing and keep the program going. And also seeing, you know, particular during this time of COVID, we know a lot of kids are you know, suffering from depression and you know, substance abuse and so forth. I really, really, really feel passionately about keeping the program going and expanding it based on this time. So um, I'll you know, look for, for any support if anybody in the community or on the council is interested in helping out, I'm, I'm really wanting to, to see them succeed. Uh, and then the other brief comment is last council meeting, we had some discussion about the Marin Park residents and uh, our meeting was postponed until the uh, 29th, I think Thursday at seven o'clock. So I, I was gonna come back and you know, give some kind of a report out, but, but there's nothing to report this time. And I'll, I'll do that at the next meeting if, if that's appropriate. And uh, with that, that's it. Thank you. Okay, good. Well, thank, thank you for engagement on, on both of those issues. Um, Appreciate it very much. Anyone else on the council to make a report? Um, I'll just mention uh, uh, two things. And um, Scott, you may want to chime in because you were there um, for the Chamber of Commerce um, board meeting as well. Um, uh, the, the the chamber meets uh, once a month, um, and I, you know, it's uh, uh, it's a great organization and getting better all the time. Um, finances are as stable as one might imagine, and certainly a lot more stable than I think we all thought they might be um, a year ago. Uh, membership is continuing to grow. We've got the College of Marin now as a member of the chamber. Uh, we'll be working with um, uh, Marin Health to see if we can bring them on. Um, and, um, and as I said, also, we have the uh, Marin Rowing Club is now a member, and we'll be having some further conversations. I met with their director uh, on that actually today. Um, the other thing I'll just mention very briefly is for MC Clean Energy, we had a board meeting last Thursday. Um, and this is an exciting time for MC and, and a challenging one. Um, uh, the focus in the meeting last Thursday was on a couple things. One was um, the formation of a new joint powers authority. Um, that would include uh, marine clean energy as well as uh, uh, three other uh, community choice aggregation entities. One's the, uh, the Peninsula Clean Energy and I can't remember the other two. Um, but the purpose of that is kind of twofold. One is to 
uh, create more of a, a capacity to uh, leverage our uh, collective role in the market um, to obtain uh, ongoing favorable uh, terms on procurement contracts, um, which, which we might be able to do better if we're working uh, if we're working together. The the other the other item of discussion, um, and actually the the JPA was approved by MC Clean Energy in a, in a resolution last Thursday. The other item that's related to that, um, that's an ongoing matter of discussion, is um, creating an ability for MCE to issue uh, tax-free uh, bonds to support um, either by itself or in conjunction with the JPA uh, investments in its own um, renewable energy uh, projects or renewable energy projects in which we would have an ownership stake. Um, that's that's new for the entity. Um, it's a little bit controversial, but I think we're moving uh, moving forward with that, and I think it's going to create uh, even in further opportunities for um, for that organization to um, manage its costs and provide benefits to uh, uh, to ratepayers and. Um, to other um, um, projects that the uh, uh, MC Clean Energy supports. So it's an exciting time, but it's uh, it's kind of we're, we're kind of st stepping our toes into a water uh, that we haven't done before at MCE with the bonding aspect, and um, we'll be working hard on that over the next couple of months. And that's all I had for my own report. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. I, I should probably, I mean, I, uh, I'll be quick. Um, yeah. Library, uh, library board, just what I should probably report to everybody. Uh, they are moving forward. There are no, no issues that need to be reported, but they're moving forward well. Uh, they are uh, working towards a post-COVID world. They're talking about serving other parts of the community with, uh, I believe they just purchased additional laptops that people are going to be able to uh, take from the library and use from their home so they can have access uh, from different places, uh, try to uh, expand uh, the uh, the number of people who have uh, broadband and are able to use the internet uh, through the library services. Um, as far as the chamber, I should probably also just mention uh, that I was uh, impressed. The, the chamber uh, appears to be working with the commons on the, um, uh, I forget what it's called, the, the, uh, the loop that they're gonna be doing, which is uh, the, the walk to try to promote both the chamber as well as the Collins, it's, it seems like a nice partnership that that's working well together. So, yeah, I, I just report on that. Okay, thank, yeah, thank, thank you. Those are those are both uh, good points to, to highlight. Um, is there anyone else from the council that wants to chime in here at this point before we move on? Um, with that, I think we'll close agenda item number six. Um, do we have uh, before I do that? Is there anybody in the in the public that would like to respond to anything that's been said? Um, by council members in their reports. I'm looking for any raised hands from our audience members. And there's no public comment. Okay. So let's move on to agenda item number seven, which are as public hearings. And I think we have one item on that, which is 7.1, which is a proposal to approve amendments to the city of Larkspur schedule of user and regulatory fees. Um, uh, which will require adoption of a resolution if that's the decision of the council. Could we have a, uh, our city manager provide a, um, uh, a staff report on that? Uh, I'm going to be very brief and turn this over to the folks that do all the heavy lifting in this item. So uh, this is a public hearing for your annual consideration of um, or review of the fees uh, that covers the fee schedule for the city. This is a process that staff goes through annually to make sure uh, we follow the policies that you put in place. Your administrative services director, Kathy Orm, is here. And uh, with her is Terry Madsen, uh, who has been our consultant for several, several years, making sure that we have accurate and defensible fees. And I'm going to turn it over to them to present the material to you. Good evening, council members. Um, as Dan said, this is a fee schedule we do every year. We've had Terry uh, working with us since 2017. And I believe he has a very brief, uh, short PowerPoint to go through, but um, we use the CPI index to keep our fees current. 
Mr. Terry. He um, ter is the principal with ClearSource. So take it away. Thanks, Jerry. Very good. Thank you, Mayor and members of the council. Thank you for allowing me to speak with you this evening. Um, as, as mentioned, we've worked with City of Larkspur for several years. Our firm helps communities throughout the state identify and recover the cost of providing services. Um, I, I will share my screen now, just briefly. I will not be long-winded. Um, are you able to see this presentation screen? Yes. Wonderful. So as uh, the city manager mentioned and Kathy mentioned, you maintain a schedule of user and regulatory fees. These, uh, this schedule identifies fees for services that are provided by the city. And what is typically uh, unique about these is their fees for services that are either um, incurred as a result of regulation that is required. So maybe somebody wants to build in Larkspur and the building code requires uh, certain types of construction. You go out and review that construction. And so there is a direct service that Larkspur is providing. Uh, this is a mechanism where you can recover the cost of that direct service um, or what we call user fees where somebody is asking for some specific service like exclusive access to uh, a field for a particular uh, amount of time or use of picnic facilities, that kind of thing. As part of your normal course of business operations, you review and update these fees um, on, a, on an annual basis. Occasionally you perform comprehensive studies where you examine your cost of service and in the interim years, the city council has authorized a CPI adjustment. As a reminder, um, what we're talking about here are fees, not taxes, not special assessments, not utility rates that, that your customers might, or your citizens might see on their monthly water bill or something like that. So really a discrete world that we're dealing with here that the vast majority of your population won't um, make need of in any, any given year. But why do cities um, proactively manage these and, and, and consistently examine them? Well, one is in order to, to be fees and not taxes, the city wants to make sure that it's following cost of service principles. So uh, California government code and the California constitution outline what are the rules and regulations concerning fees and our identification of costs. So we wanna make sure that we follow those, those guidelines. Again, we're talking about services that really can be seen as providing a discrete or direct benefit. And cities uh, frequently look to, um, when you're providing something that's a direct benefit, you find a direct revenue source to, to offset that, that cost of service so that, um, you can relieve the general fund as much as possible to provide services of greater community-wide benefit. So greater community-wide benefit typically sourced through the general fund, more individual direct benefit. Uh, frequently, we try and find fees as a mechanism for recovery of those costs. Another really important um, example of why cities proactively manage um, this, this revenue stream and these costs is that um, as a community, we have a service level expectation. So if we submit plans for review or we require inspection, we believe that that inspection is going to occur within a particular amount of time, those kind of things. If we uh, want access to uh, picnic facilities for a party, we're hoping that the facility looks a certain way. These uh, a, a adjusting fees on an ongoing basis helps us continue to meet the service level expectation of the community. That, that is a primary goal of this. Um, the fee schedule was most recently updated to go into effect for fiscal year 2021. What is before the council this evening is proposed to go into effect 21-22. Um, in the prior year, the city council, when it adopted the resolution, it also said, uh, we authorize this annual update by the change in regional cost inflation. And we, to, to reflect that, we typically go grab a regional consumer price index. The most recent annual change in the consumer price index was 1.72%. So the fees um, being brought before council this evening 
are reflect that 1.72% increase. There is, um, this is not to promote or offer new services. It's instead an adjustment to offset the cost of providing existing services within the city. So this concludes my presentation, but I'm available to receive any feedback or questions from the council or the public. Thank you. Great, Th thanks very much. Um, any comments or questions from the council? I think I see Vice Mayor Helmer. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, are there any impacts from the past uh, year plus since the pandemic has begun that would affect the factors uh, in consideration of these changes? Well, um, I'm, I'm happy to chime in, but it would be editorial comments, but you heard one example of a comment from the city manager earlier this evening. Um, most of the fee revenue comes in the form of building permits. And while you might have expected that maybe building permit activity would have ceased during the pandemic, what we found from community after community after community is hey, there is still a robust request for um, remodel reviews, tenant improvement reviews, reviews of some form of new construction. So there is a demand for service and uh, you know, a high demand on, on communities to provide these services. And so um, uh, the CPI update, where maybe we would have said, hey, something has completely uh, disintegrated. Maybe, maybe you would rethink it. But this minor CPI update, um, most of our communities are continued, you know, the ones that proactively manage fees on a year to year to year basis, they are continuing with this, with this ongoing adjustment instead of taking something static um, and maybe a few years from now having more of like a peak and valley type transition. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, does that answer your question, Dan? Yes, thank you. Good, great. Um, and I see council member Paulson has his hand up. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Terry, two, two brief questions. Um, one is relatively minor. Uh, you know, I looked over the 11 categories and while the CPI is, I, I believe you said 0.17%, um, it doesn't seem like there's an exact um, you know, increase across those categories. So one of the administrative fees was a bit different than, for example, flood main, floodplain management permitting fees. Can you explain, you know, even though it's not a lot, um, can you explain what those variations are? And then my second question is, in the entire document, I don't see anything about you know, adjustments like you know, senior exemptions or anything. And I, I imagine that's not part of this, but if you can just clarify that you know, people who may have been hit hard by COVID you know, to you know, extend uh, Vice Mayor uh, Hilmer's point, you know that that you know if if there had been any adjustments to concessions and permitting and you know and you know sort of extenuating circumstances for you know any of these fees. So I can comment on um, maybe as you mentioned the CPI change, the annual change in regional CPI was one point seven two percent. But if you went through sort of line item by line item, you may not always see an exact 1.72%. Most of the time that's a rounding issue. So we may want to round a fee to the nearest dollar or the nearest $5. Um, we sometimes keep deposit amounts unchanged because they are deposits by nature, but the underlying hourly time and materials billings, we're gonna try and increase those by 1.72% or the nearest dollar. Um, like I said, sometimes it fluctuates due to rounding. Um, from a permitting standpoint, we're not, a, I know, I, I, I think I heard community development director Toft is, is available. I do not know of any sort of ongoing senior exemptions. There are provisions in, I think it's the, either the health and safety code, I think it's California health and safety code that you know, if you are um, a senior that requires some certain um, 
uh, accommodation due to disability, that there's a, a way you can come in and um, discuss that with a building department and they're, you know, it allows for modification of fees under certain services. I think it's disabled veterans and seniors um, that, that can show that um, what they're requesting permit for is to accommodate um, their, their particular disability. Okay, and, thank you very much. Uh, Council Member Paulson, I just wanted to highlight that uh, under the emergency authority that the council gave me, we did waive all fees related to permits for businesses that were taking their business outside so they could continue to operate during the pandemic. So we, we didn't charge for those items. Um, we don't typically adjust the fees in the schedule for hardship. Occasionally we do have people approach us about hardship and um, on, a, on very rare occasions for larger fees, we've created payment plans for folks, um, but we still collect the fee during this fiscal year. Um, if we were to do anything more extensive than that, we would actually bring it to the council because adjusting the fees for an individual is an action the council needs to consider um, by either putting a policy in place that covers everyone, or you would consider them on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments from the council? Um, seeing none, since this is a public hearing, do we need to kind of suspend before we go to uh, public comment or could we just go directly to that? I think if there are any other questions, we take those and then you would uh, seek public comment before returning for council yeah. discussion and yeah. action. So, so if there's no other uh, questions from the council, then let's make that uh, shift to the public. Looking for any raised hands from our audience members or any emailed public comment. And there is no public comment. Okay, well, then uh, we'll close the public comment process and bring it back to the council. Um, and uh, ask if there are any further comments or questions from the council um, before asking for uh, approval of the resolution. Seeing none, can I have a motion? Yeah, I'm ready to move to uh, approve the fee increases. Okay, do I have a second? A second. Okay, Allison, it's yours. Council member Kandel? Yes. Council member Paulson? Yes. Council member Way? Yes. Vice Mayor Helmer? Yes. Mayor Haroff? Yes. So the motion is approved and uh, we'll move forward. Thank you all. Uh, Thanks, then we'll Terry. move on. We'll move on. Yes. Thanks very much, Terry. Um, Thank you, Terry. Um, it, it keeps us up to date and we appreciate that. So I think the last uh, substantive item on the agenda uh, is a business item, which is uh, our usual update on city activities and finances with regards to COVID-19. And I'll turn it back over to our city manager for that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll be very brief. Uh, first, um, we have set a target to begin allowing in-person services inside City Hall in the first week of May. Uh, we'll be providing information to the public next week about how they can make appointments, whether that be with the planning and building department or with the, in, in the library. Um, access will be controlled as we go forward. Now we're still a small space with um, some logistical challenges and we wanna make sure everybody feels safe and comfortable as we slowly uh, begin our recovery process. Um, the other thing I want to let the council know is, uh, and I've been accused of being in a cynical mood of late, um, but um, not surprisingly, the information coming from the federal government about the stimulus money is very confusing and nobody is at all clear what the rules are gonna be for cl claiming the money assigned to a city. So uh, that is my best information. Uh, Kathy Orms left now, but she and I spent a good 30 minutes discussing how confused we are. So 
Yeah, uh, I think I think that's a, that's a that's an understatement. I you're you're closer to that issue than I am, but to the extent that I've been able to follow it, I can't. <laughs> so. so we will keep uh, monitoring, and once we have more definitive information, we will let you know. Um, and then I uh, just wanted to also highlight that we are aware we're going into a very dry season, and so we are we have started discussions about what does emergency preparedness and responsiveness look like in the COVID situation? You know, one of the things that is near and dear to many members of your staff is we made an investment to be a clean air, a, a clean air space in city hall and potentially in hall gym and some other places. And you may recall, we opened up the community room at Central Marine Police Authority uh, when the PSPS happened. Uh, where will those things happen? in the COVID era, even as we, uh, you know, many of us are now getting vaccinated. It's, um, it's unclear, but we're working on it now. And I just wanted to counsel to know, uh, we view this as a pressing concern that we're trying to address. Okay, thank, thank you for that. Any, any questions or comments from the council? Yeah, I just yeah had, I see, uh, Catherine, go ahead. I just had one, Dan, are you getting any help from the league? Um, a, are the city managers getting any help from the league on this as far as the federal fund stimulus funds? Are, are they putting out any, any feelers to, to provide help to uh, better assess what this means to smaller cities? Well, it's not just smaller cities. The, the, the federal government is trying to write rules now to fit the package. So the league is kind of one of our main sources of information. Um, right now, to just elaborate a little more, the, the biggest confusion is what exactly does it mean to quantify what you lost during the pandemic and so that you can backfill your losses. Initially, we'd gotten the impression you would say, you know, we used to get sales tax amount X and now we get sales tax amount Y, so the delta is what we lost. Now we're hearing word that they're actually going to look at um, how you finish this fiscal year relative to the budget you adopted, which is really problematic for a city like Larkspur because we cut hard against the pandemic. Right. Right. It's almost going to reward you if you just said, we're going to shrug and assume the federal government will bail us out sometime. Uh, so if that's the path we end up on, I'm, I'm pretty nervous. Yeah. Yeah, that, thanks for that. Does that, does that answer, Catherine? Yes, it makes me realize why he has been cynical lately. Yeah. <laughs> this is, this is going to be a tough one to, to sort out. Any other comments or questions from the council on this item? Hopefully we get into the yellow tier soon. We were close. Now we have to oh, wait yeah. May 5th. Yeah, I thought I thought we were on our way, but I guess we got a colder breath still a little bit more on that. I do see there's a member of the public. with. Yes. Breath. So Allison, is there, let's open it up. If there's no more comments or questions from the council, let's open it up to the public. Our first comment will come from Kevin Carroll. I don't, good evening. And I don't expect an answer on this tonight, but it, it just, struck me i do a lot of walking around the city and with the recent announcement uh, by marin municipal water district on the rather drastic cutbacks we look like we're facing if in the future there could be a report on how that's going to affect our parks i mean i know for civilians they're saying we can only use water one day a week and that sounds pretty thin for what might be a long, hot summer. Uh, so we're getting a little tangential topic, but I will use this as a chance to highlight that Marin Municipal Water District staff are attending your next council meeting to talk to you about drought conditions and regulations. Oh, good. Well, we'll have lots of good questions for them. <laughs> okay, anyone else from the public? looking for any further raised hands in our audience and there's no further public comment okay all right well uh unless there's something more from any members of the council i think we'll 
conclude agenda number eight and we'll move on to agenda item number nine, which is adjournment. Um, uh, unless someone wants to address anything more, can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. I'll second that. And I will do my usual deal here and by consensus, um, we are adjourned. Have a good night, everybody. Bye, gang. Thank good you. Night. Good night.